um, we are trying to understand um, what kind of ground state arises from this uh, Hamiltonian. So this Hamiltonian is defined on some lattice. And uh, imagine some square lattice in 2D, chain in 1D, cubic lattice in 3D, and so on. But the lattice structure itself is not so important. And at every side, there's a rotor that can rotate. And uh, the first term in the Hamiltonian is proportional to the square of the angular momentum. So uh, in the ground state, uh, this term favors the state with a zero angular momentum state okay, at each side. And then second term, Previously, I wrote that second term as this, where ij is sum of all ordered pairs of uh, nearest neighbor, like side one and two, and two and, two and one, etc. Where, um, although total angular momentum is conserved, you can create an angular momentum at side i at the expense of lowering the angular momentum at the near, uh, near, uh, near, nearby sites. Okay. So it, this describes the hopping of angular momentum. Okay? Or another way of understanding this term is that uh, this energy is minimized when angle of two rotors that are next to each other are pointing the same direction. Okay? And here I have uh, uh, written this term as uh, sum over all side, and then at each side, this rotor can interact with its neighbors, either in the x direction or y direction. Okay, so this mu runs from one to d, where d is the space dimension. Okay? And then, because for every link, I have a, a, a two term for ij and ji, right? So therefore, I combine this into two times cosine. And here you can immediately see that this term favors the state where spins up, the, the rotors are pointing along the along same direction. Okay? Um, classically, you can minimize both because uh, <clears throat> angular momentum and angle can be simultaneously uh, Specified, but in quantum mechanics, that's not possible. So, so if you want to minimize the angular momentum, then you have large uncertainty in your angle. So, therefore, it will be very hard to align with your neighbor. So, therefore, you pay some energy coming from the trouble with your neighbor. Okay. On the other hand. If you want to make this term lower, then you want to align along the same direction as your neighbor. But then, as the angle becomes more well-defined, you have a large uncertainty in angular momentum. And then you have to pay this extra energy, right? So it's, this is competition. And as a result of this competition, uh, interesting uh, state can emerge, okay? And uh, yesterday, um, we derived this formula. This is a path integral representation of this ground state, okay? Until we do this integration and sum exactly, we don't know what the exact ground state is, but still this is very useful in that it, go, it gives us the, the picture about what quantum fluctuation does to to um, pick the right ground state. So the ground state wave function is given by uh, sum of all paths. Okay, is this theta one and theta n is the value of uh, angle that this rotor can have at each step of imaginary time evolution. And n is the angular momentum at each time and uh, use sum of all possible values of angle and angular momentum that these rotors can have at each time step. So this sum and integration over angle and angular momentum represents sum over path. 
in the space of uh, angle and angular momentum that connects your seed state, who's, uh, who, who, uh, which is uh, psi of s, to your final ground state. You, but you sum over all paths, and each path has some contribution to your ground state wave function. And that weight is determined by this number. This is a function of path. So if you specify one path, this number spits out, uh, this, this formula spits out number. That's the weight of that path. And then in quantum mechanics, you sum over all those amplitude, right? And then the net amplitude gives the final ground state wave function. And we saw that this weight can be viewed as a e to the minus some action, what we call the action. And this, this action is nothing but the action that you extremize to find the classical trajectory in Lagrangian dynamics. Only difference is here is that we are evolving in imaginary time instead of real time. That's one difference. More importantly, in quantum mechanics, you, not on, you, you don't just pick the uh, extremized path, but you sum over all paths. Of course, the path where the action is minimum give rise to the largest weight. But that's not all. You have to sum over all paths. This sum means there's a fluctuations in the path. And we call this quantum fluctuation. Because here, here we are talking about zero temperature. So there is no thermal fluctuation. We are, this is a ground state. Okay? But it, within the ground state, there is a fluctuation due to this uncertainty principle. And we first uh, look at the ground state in the limit that uh, t is very small. And here, because the ground state doesn't really depend on the overall, overall uh, scale, right? If you just, just multiply this whole Hamiltonian by 10, ground state still, still remains the same, right? So therefore, ground state depends only on the ratio between u and t, okay? So there's only one parameter. So here I just... Uh, parameterize the ratio between u and t in terms of one angle eta. Okay, and then when eta changes from zero to pi over two, t over u ratios changes from infinity to uh, zero, or zero to infinity, I guess, right? Zero to infinity. And we first, yesterday, looked at this limit. So if we first uh, consider the limit where t is zero, if you have only U term, not surprisingly, now without the T term, now you don't care about your, your neighbor because you are not talking to your neighbor, right? So you just want to make your angular momentum lowest possible, okay? And that is your ground state. And there's only one way to minimize that energy, setting all n to be zero. So there's a unique ground state. And we also saw that uh, there are uh, two times v, first excited state, where v is the number of sites here, because you can put angular momentum one or minus one at, at, at any site. And they are all degenerate when t is zero. But then, when you make t a little bit non-zero, but still com small compared to u, then we so that the uh, ground state get uh, corrected. Not on, in, within your ground state, you not only have all zero, zero angular momentum state, but once in a while you have some non-zero probability to having pairs of uh, particle and antiparticle, right? By that, I mean angular momentum one and minus one state. But we saw that when t is small, the size of this pair remains small, okay? And uh, also, because there is a gap between ground state and the first excited state at t equals zero, this gap cannot suddenly vanish as you make t non-zero, just because of continuity. So therefore, ground state at non-zero t is qualitatively same as ground state at t equals zero. They are not the same you have some little pairs of particle and entire particle pair, but they are small, so you don't see them very often, and they are 
they are not very well separated, they are localized. So ground state is qualitatively same as the ground state you have in the, in the zero um, T limit. Okay? This is what we discussed yesterday. Okay? Today, uh, we are going to look at the other limit, um, where uh, T is large and U is small. Okay? If, T is, if U was zero, right, then um, now you don't care what angular momentum state you have. No matter how big your angular momentum is, there is no energetic penalty. So only thing that you care about is to align with your neighbor, right? To minimize your energy. So therefore, this path integration, in that case, will be dominated by the path where all angles are same across the whole system. I mean, you can see it. When all thetas are same for all sides, then this cosine is maximized, so minus. When t is positive, this is minimized. That will be the ground state. Yes? Well, for the, all the angles to be aligned, the angular momentum at each side shouldn't be the same. Angular momentum is highly fluctuating. Yeah. Yeah. So, but when u is 0, that's fine. You don't, you don't worry about. The angles be aligned. Imagine a small evolution in time. The angles should be the same at every time, so they should rotate at the same velocity. That's right. So that's, that's an interesting question. So uh, we, will, we will see that. So what, what happens is that uh, when, uh, when u is exactly 0, you don't even have that kind of fluctuation because uh, theta, so at u equals 0, this is the exact ground state where you put or angle at some specific direction. But that angle doesn't change in time. Right, because this is a ground state. If you prepare your state to be this, this is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, so therefore it doesn't change. It's, it's, it's stationary. But this doesn't break the uncertainty principle because you know the angles and the angular momentum. No, you don't know angular momentum about this because here your angle is certain and you have infinite uncertainty in your angular momentum. So delta n, if you compute it, is infinite for this state. So if you compute, because wave function is delta function, what is angular momentum? Square. It's a two derivative in, this is n square, right? And then if you apply this to the delta function, it's infinite. The expectation value of this operator for delta function wave function is infinite. So average angular momentum is infinite for this wave function, which is fine as far as u is 0. OK? And uh, because that phi can be anything, as far as all rotors point along the same direction, energy doesn't depend on phi because your relative angle with your neighbor is still zero, right? So therefore, you have lots of ground state here, infinitely many, continuously many ground state because you can pick different phi, right? And then, not only that, you can change the relative angle re slightly. You can misalign a little bit differently from your neighbor. That will cost a little bit of energy, right? But you can make that angular difference arbitrarily small. That means above the ground state, you have an excited state with arbitrarily small energy, right? That means at this point, you have an infinitely many ground state and continuum of excited state above that. That's the picture at u equals 0, OK? Now, this is, this is easy. For that, we don't, we don't even need a path integration. You can just figure that out uh, from that Hamiltonian. The key question is the following. What happens if you turn on a little bit of u? 
Now, if you, you become non-zero, no matter how small it is, it will begin to penalize the state with a large angular momentum, right? So therefore, you cannot perfectly align with your neighbor, okay? Therefore, in the path integration, you will begin to see non-zero contribution of paths where the angle is misaligned a little bit. So it creates quantum fluctuation, okay? And question is, does that quantum fluctuation, uh, what, what, what does that quantum fluctuation do to the ground state? Will that quantum fluctuation uh, keep this infinitely many degeneracy of the ground state? Or will it mix state with a different orientation such that your ground state probably is given by some particular linear combination of those degenerate ground state and lift the degeneracy. So here, no matter how small u is, that can have an important effect because you have a complete degeneracy, right? So you, probably you have learned the uh, perturbation theory, right? non-degenerate and degenerate perturbation theory. And probably you remember the fact that when energy levels are degenerate, no matter how weak the perturbation is, in the presence of perturbation, the wave function, eigenstate wave function, can be order of one different, right? From any of the non-perturbed, uh, one of the non-perturbed uh, ground state. So that means no matter how small u is, if it is non-zero, you can have a qualitatively new ground state in principle. Okay, is this clear? That's what we are going to address today. So we are going to ask what happens if we turn a little bit of non-zero u and we will see what happens to the ground state. In particular, we are going to look for uh, whether whether uh, the ground state uh, keep any memory of the my seed state. Okay, in the large U limit here, it didn't keep the memory, right? Because ground state is unique. No matter what seed state you prepare, after this uh, projection, my ground state forget about any information about the seed state. Of course, the normaliz overall normalization depends on how big the weight of your ground state was within your seed state. But modulo that overall normalization, the ground state doesn't keep any information about your seed state, which means that ground state is unique. No matter how you initially pre prepare your seed state, you always converge into same ground state, right? Now, question is, what happens here? So what we are going to do there is to, we are going to prepare a seed state that uh, is aligned in particular direction. So we are going to choose this as our seed state. So this seed state has a parameter phi, right? That phi is the direction that I initially prepare my seed state. Question is, does my ground state remember this phi? or not? Okay, so that's the question. So to answer this question, we can in principle do this path integration in the small uh, u limit and compute the ground state wave function explicitly. That's possible. But easier way to, uh, to, uh, to figure that out is uh, compute the expectation value of some observable. Okay, so what kind of, uh, so I want to find some observable. And this is my ground state. So this ground state is obtained from my, this seed state, okay? Then I want to compute some observable here. And what kind of observable can tell me 
whether my ground state depends on the phi or not. Angle, right? Yeah. And, uh, but angle is periodic, so maybe some sinusoidal function of angle, right? So, for example, I can compute e to the i theta maybe at one site. Let's call this the origin. So let's compute the expectation value of this angle at the origin with respect to the ground state, right? If ground state remembers angle phi of seed state, my expectation value will depend on phi. That means depending on which, initial, which seed state I prepare, I will have a different ground state, right? If it doesn't depend on phi, that will mean that ground state will forget that initial information. Okay? Yeah. So, this is what we are going to compute. So, this is uh, the goal to compute this in the limit that uh, u is small but, but non zero. Okay. So, here, um, um, we first uh, compute this path integration, and uh, final expectation value is computed, expressed as a function of, uh, as an as a integration of angle. And also because the angle is uh, almost classical variable here, angle doesn't fluctuate much, right? But an, angular momentum is wildly fluctuating. So therefore, in this path integration, it's convenient to do the angular path integration, angular momentum path integration first, because this is wildly fluctuating variable. So we are going to do this sum first. Okay. And uh, so here, this sum is a sum of all possible angular momentum at every site and at every time step. Okay. So there are a lot of integration to do, but fortunately they are all the same because at every site and at every time step, this is a term that you have. And also Hamiltonian is ultra local in N, right? So as far as angular momentum is concerned, there's no coupling between neighboring sites. So therefore you can do the summation at each site, at each time slice independently from each other without having to worry about other angular momentum, right? Is this clear? So in this massive summation, I'm going to pick one particular time step L and one particular site and do the sum. And then I can use it for other site trivially, right? So let's do that. So what I need is sum over n, so this n represent here angular momentum at particular site and at particular time step, which runs from minus infinity to infinity or possible integer, right? e to the minus e to the i n times uh, uh, some angular difference between two time step. Let's call this delta theta. Minus, in, in this Hamiltonian, uh, there's only one term that includes nil, which comes from time step, time, time step L, that particular time step, and that particular side I, right? Which is just this term, right? So I have epsilon, which is small time step times u over 4 and square. This is what you have to do. Well, if you, do, um, if you do this exactly, you get some elliptic function. But we, we are only interested in this function in the limit where epsilon is very small, because epsilon is the time, infinitesimal time step that we are going to take to zero, right? In that limit, you can imagine that um, this is non-zero, but very, very small. So therefore, e to the minus n square term is a very broad Gaussian, right? That means n can 
the sum that does the, the n that contribute to this sum uh, is large. It's order of one over square root of epsilon, right? So you have large fluctuations of n. And uh, you have this phase factor e to the n times delta theta, right? And if delta theta is non-zero, then as you sum over different n, you have a, a very oscillatory term, right? So there will be destructive interference. So you expect that this answer will be small when delta theta is non-zero. Whereas when delta theta is zero, all different n contribute with the same phase. So they will add up. They will interfere constructively, right? So it's not hard to see that the resulting integration is sharply peaked at delta theta equals to zero. Okay? And if you do it explicitly, in the small epsilon limit, this is what you get, e to the um, yeah, e to the uh, minus one over u epsilon delta theta square in the in the small epsilon limit. <clears throat> you may wonder where the left hand side is a periodic function of delta theta. When delta theta changes by two pi, this answer shouldn't change, right? But the right hand side is not periodic function, so you may, want, uh, you may worry about it. Here, I have chosen the domain of delta theta to be from minus pi to pi within that part. I, in, generality, in generality, I can always choose my delta theta to be between minus pi and pi, okay? So if, if this is circle, if one angle is here and here, delta theta is not this, but this. Shortest path. This is some, some, some minor, minor detail. Uh, yeah, I, I encourage you to do this, uh, uh, do this uh, yourself. It's, a, it's a, a good exercise. OK. Now, and we can apply that formula for every side, because in this free integration, I have, uh, I have to sum over n for every time step at every side independently. And instead of this, I have uh, this kind of term at every time step at every side i, right? Similar here, where delta theta n, th this, this is just uh, this one. And this is also sum over i. Um, for each L. I have sum over L as well. So therefore, what you have is just a sum over for different L at different I. L I. Right? Now, um, now, what we have is the following. My ground state obtained from the seed state S is written now only in terms of, so I still take the large T limit, uh, written only in terms of sum over path labeled by angle. Uh, okay, and sometimes uh, People write this as a sum over path in angle, and then people use this, this uh, notation. But it just means this. At every time step, angle can take different value independently. OK? Now, let's see what's the weight. So I have e to the minus sum over L. And uh, uh, from this term, sum over L and then sum over I. So from this term, I have uh, 1 over U epsilon 
theta L is at L plus 1 minus theta L square at each side. That's the contribution from angular momentum contribution, right? And then we also have to remember that we have T term. So T term has uh, um, T times epsilon times sum over all direction, cosine theta i plus mu minus theta i, like this. Now, this epsilon is the size of the imaginary time step. And the sum over L, sum over different time step weighted by epsilon is integration along the imaginary time. So therefore, I will factor this epsilon out here and going to write this as a integration of imaginary time from zero to T. But then when I factor out, I have one additional factor of epsilon in the downstairs there. And uh, delta theta divided by epsilon is the derivative of theta in the imaginary time direction. Okay? So this first term is 1 over u times, okay, I still have sum over side. And the first term gives 1 over u times time derivative of angle along the imaginary time direction minus t sum over direction cosine theta. So I replaced the index for different time step with time tau as a continuous variable. Okay. So this is my new expression for the ground state. And uh, um, because I have chosen my seed state to be, to be that one, so I have to remember that my seed state is there for theta, for theta 1 it, in the initial step, right? And this seed state uh, is a delta function. It, every angle is pointing along the phi direction. So therefore, in this path integration, I have to impose the boundary condition where theta at every side at time zero is phi. That's the initial, initial boundary condition, right? And then in between, from this ang angle to the final angle, they are all paths are integrated over. But remember, the last angle here uh, is the argument of my wave function, right? So therefore, angle at time t is argument of my uh, wave function, theta. So the picture is that uh, you have some lattice, and at each, at each uh, side, you have a rotor that can have a different angle. And this rotor propagates from time tau equal 0 to tau equal, tau equal t along the imaginary time direction. And there's a rotor at every side. This is side 1, 2, et cetera. And then uh, initially, at time equal 0, all rotors are pointing in particular direction, say this direction. This is phi direction, right? And then you want to know the wave function, the probability amplitude for your ground state wave function to have some angle theta. Okay, this is your uh, argument, right? This, this is not fixed, right? For example, suppose you want to know the probability amplitude for these rotors to have, say, this angle, this angle, and this angle. And I want to compute the weight of the ground state for this configuration. This formula says what you have to do, you start from this initial configuration, and you end this final configuration, and you sum over all possible paths that connect this initial and final condition. OK? 
Okay, so you can have a, some paths like this independently side, side by side, right? Because they can fluctuate independently from each other. Sometimes you can go and round many times before reaching the fi final destination. So you sum over all those paths. And at the end of the day, the final answer, if you sum over all weight, it will give the weight function for this angle, right? And then you can change uh, the final angle differently and see how the weight or ground state wave function depends on that angle. Okay. This is the picture. Um, okay. A any question about about this point about this picture? Yes. So yeah, so ground state wave function is probability amplitude for say theta one, first rotor have theta one, second rotor have theta two, etc. right? And probability is given by modulo square of this. That's the probability for you to find your rotors are pointing along that direction in that ground state. When you prepare your seed state to be that one. Okay, so, um, okay, so now, um, maybe one more step. So because the ground state depends only on the ratio between T and U, uh, but this expression depends on T and U, appears to depend on T and U separately, so therefore, uh, but you can rescale your imaginary time such that the expression depends only on the ratio. For example, if you rescale tau to be um, one over square root of t times u tau prime, okay, then uh, the first term I have uh, d tau times uh, d theta d tau square goes into, this is proportional to one over tau prime, right? So this goes as a square root of T u d tau prime d theta d tau prime square. And then the second term, so there's a one over u here, so there's one over u, then one over u. And then the second term, I have T times something times this measure d tau, right? And this goes into square root of T over u d tau prime, right? Then now both term, the first and second term, is proportional to square root of t over u. So I'm going to define square root of t over u, the ratio, to be 1 over g square, where this is uh, the definition of g square. And then, of course, the, in d tau prime, the range of the d tau will be modified, but we are going to take the large t limit anyway. So it's the same. So um, in this uh, expression, my ground state is uh, sum of all paths e to the minus 1 over g square over a factor times d tau and then sum over i okay with with this uh, boundary condition and uh uh, in general, we don't know how to compute this exactly, okay? 
because the action is highly non-Gaussian. Because if you expand cosine, not only includes theta to the square, it includes theta to the fourth, and etc. So it's not harmonic oscillator, it's unharmonic oscillator. So we don't know how to do this. But in the limit that u is very small, 1 over g squared is very large. We usually call this the weak coupling limit, but the, this is not important. So in the, when 1 over g squared is very large, right, then small change in this action creates a big change in the weight. Right? So therefore, the path integration will be dominated by the paths that minimize this action. Right? This path is uh, called saddle point path. Okay? So among all possible paths, the most important uh, path arises when, when, uh, when this is minimized. Okay? But before we do that, let's finish uh, deriving this expression because at the end of the day, what we care about is this, just uh, one number. Right? Now, that is a wave function. It's more complicated. It's a function of theta, right? But now this is the expectation value, just one number. And the question is, does this number depend on phi or not? That's the question. So let's, let's compute this. So now we have, a, we have this uh, uh, path integral representation of uh, one ground state. That's, that's this one, say, this one. But two, um, uh, to compute the expectation value, we have another ground state, okay? Um, where, because the, here, the action is real, okay? So psi star is same as psi. This is not generally true, but this is true in this particular model. So we don't have to worry about psi star. This is same as psi, okay? Now we have a two ground state. And each ground state is uh, represented as the path integration. Okay, so let me write here. I have sum over this argument of the angle for the yeah. Professor, what happens if you try to explain the cosine by a Taylor Swift uh, polynomial in the second order? Because you are starting with the same position. So I think it's for, I don't know. Very good, yeah. Time, that, good that, yeah, that makes sense, right? Okay. Especially when 1 over g is large. Exactly. Yeah. So you can resolve exactly the expression if you have this. Kind yeah, of okay, let's do that. Yeah, okay. so we, we are going to do that. So, but before we do that, let's first finish writing this expression as a path integration. So uh, here I have uh, this ground state written there. So that ground state is given by path integration of, uh, of over theta. But um, this, this is a dummy variable, right? So I can call dummy variable whatever I want. So I will call this, say, theta tilde as far as this dummy variable satisfy this condition, I'm good, right? Because I'm integrating over all possible uh, path, right? Okay, so for, for one of the ground state, I have theta tilde, and um, let me write this as a one over, okay, uh, one over, sorry, minus d tau tilde, and uh, from zero to t, and let's write this as a Lagrangian, okay? Just to simplify the writing. So this, this one over g square and this thing is my Lagrangian. Time integration of Lagrangian is action, which is function of theta tilde, okay? Where, uh, this theta tilde has a boundary condition at 0 equal phi, t equal this theta. This theta that we are going to finally integrate over. 
This is the first bit, the ground state. And second ground state, I have uh, another path integration, right? So for that, let me use theta tilde prime, another dummy variable, where I have d tau prime tilde, and same Lagrangian, but now this is a uh, action for my new path integration. Again, with the same boundary condition, at zero is phi, at t is that theta that we are going to finally integrate over. So you, you compute the, okay, you, you, you compute ground state twice to compute the overlap, right? And to compute the ground state, you have to do pass integration each, right? After you have done that, you sum over all possible angles within your ground state weighted by this observable e to the i theta at side zero. Yes? Do you consider that you need to do just one integration? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the uh, it's same thing, right? Yeah. So let's do that. Yeah. So you are guiding the, you're leading the lecture. That's good. So, um, so, um, okay, so before we do that, let's just uh, make some pictures. So, one of the ground state is this thing. I have, a, I have this uh, cylinder, uh, and then I do the path integration from zero to t. That's one of the ground state. For another ground state, I have uh, one other set of, uh, okay, let me, what is this? For, for the second ground state, I have uh, another set of, uh, uh, let me just draw the side one. Yeah. Aren't you missing psi of s? Hmm? The six phase. Psi of s yeah. is encoded in this initial condition because I have chosen my initial seed state to point along this phi direction. Okay. So that's in the boundary condition. So this is my second ground state, again, integral from 0 to t. But then uh, here is angle is fixed by phi here, right? This, I'm looking on the side one, right? Then I, I, I do the path integration, but end point is same. If this is theta one, this is also theta one, right? And then at the end of the day, I integrate over that theta one which amounts to gluing these two, and then sum over all possible values that this theta can have at the joint. Right? Is it clear? So I have this picture. I am gluing this like this. And I'm, this is the theta value, that the values that wave function can have theta, right? But at the last stage, I sum over all, all possible theta. That amounts not, that means now I, I sum over all paths from here to here, including all possible value that theta can have at this intersection. Okay? Only one, one side is different is, uh, at, at the one side, because we are computing this expectation value at one side, at the origin, we are inserting this additional operator as we, as we do it. But all other side is a simple gluing at the original site, at the site of gluing, I insert some operator. So let me maybe, I glue this with this. This is side two, like this, right? And then uh, at, on you, at one side, say this was side zero, then here you insert, when you do the path integration, you insert e to the i theta zero. Okay, so depending on what theta value you have, you have this uh, complex phase. Okay, that's the picture. And as, uh, as it was suggested, this path integration can be just viewed as a one path integration for time 2t. 
in, initially I have only 0 to t, right? But now I can change the direction of the time so that this is 0 to, say, minus t to t. To t. Okay, so let's do that. So, so we are going to now map these two paths into one whole path. So we are going to introduce my new path integration variable theta i that is defined between minus t and t. And then in the first half, when tau is between minus t and 0, that corresponds to first part of the ground state wave function, the first part of the path integration for the ground state wave function. So I just shift. This is theta tilde, where it's a tau uh, minus t, right? So that way, when, um, when tau is minus t, that means theta tilde at 0, right? So now, this, is, uh, this part was uh, theta tilde, okay? That runs from 0 to t. Here, this is 0 to t. I'm just relabeling this as a uh, theta from minus t to 0, right? Just relabeling. And I'm going to call a path integration variable in this part, which is theta tilde prime, as a, as a theta defined between 0 and t. OK, so I'm going to for tau between 0 and t, I'm going to, this, uh, uh, I'm going to define this as a theta tilde prime. Uh, to do that, uh, 2 t minus tau, right? Because when tau is, um, maybe just, just t over, maybe just t over tau. Isn't it the first uh, tau plus t, t? Yeah, I think you're right. The, the, the first one. Oh. For plus t. Plus t. Is it? Oh, yeah. Thank you. You're right. Yeah, that's right. What is here? It is. Uh, hmm? No, I. So this, this theta prime is uh, defined for tau 0 and t, right? And I want to map this into 0. Sorry. I want to map. Um, this to be 0, actually, and this to be 2t. Sorry, 0 to t, sorry. Yeah, 0 to t. So, t minus tau. T minus tau, yeah. Then, yeah, you're right. This is just a relabeling, right? Right. Then I, I just have, have one, one path integral variable that is defined from minus t to t. The nice thing about, is, about that action is that uh, the action doesn't explicitly depend on tau. So it is invariant whether you translate by some constant or not. So same action. Also, that action is invariant uh, under switching the sign of tau because it's a square of the time derivative, right? It's a time reversal invariant. So therefore, even if even if you translate by some constant and switch the direction of time, you still have the same action, same Lagrangian. So therefore, therefore, this ground state is now written as a path integration of theta where theta is defined from minus t to t, okay, with only one action that is defined from minus t to t, the same Lagrangian, 
for theta. And uh, we have to still insert this operator. This op operator is just theta defined at time zero, right? Because this is in the middle at the, as, a, as a joint point, right? So what is inserting here is e to the i theta at time zero at side zero. With a boundary condition that what is the boundary condition? What is the theta value? What is the theta at minus t? Phi, that's phi, right? And also, another boundary is at time t, right? That's also phi. So this is the boundary condition. Basically, what, I'm, what I have done is just uh, unbend this cylinder into straight cylinder with size 2t from, that runs from minus t to t, right? And then at the two end, the angle is fixed to be phi. And then you sum over all paths from phi to phi. Only thing that I'm doing differently than that is at, side, at, at one side, I'm inserting that additional phase, phase uh, operator here. Where is it? Yeah, th this operator here, right? So that, um, yeah. This is this is uh, like the expected value. that's the expectation value. Okay. Now this this part is the yeah. That is the ground state. That is the function of theta, right? Yeah. This is the function of theta. Now, after I found that ground state to compute the expectation value, I'm now averaging over theta. Finally, what arises is just number. Sorry, so I confuse it by this. So this is the expectation value of i theta at zero. This is just number, number that depends on only on g. Yes. Can you uh, abuse the fact that this is some kind of loop? Loop in the in which in the angle direction or? Ah, but, okay, but phi is fixed. We are not summing over all phi. If you sum over all phi, that means you average this expectation value over different choices of seed state. But you don't want to do that because we want to see whether ground state remembers information about particular seed state. Okay, so in general, this, this is something that can depend on the seed state or phi. So in general, this can be function of t over u or g and phi. So now it's a mathematical question. Does this depend on phi or not in the large t limit? So I forgot to take in large t limit. It shouldn't. Hmm? It shouldn't. OK. Who think it cannot? Yeah. Yeah. I think it cannot. You think it cannot? Yeah. Okay. That's good because then you will see more fun uh, effect. <laughs> Anyone think differently? Yeah, I mean, not, I think that's the kind of our intuition. Um, this quantum fluctuation. It will erase this uh, memory of the seed state, okay? Okay. When that doesn't happen, that's what we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, that's what we are getting to. Okay, any other question? How, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. 15, okay. So, uh, okay, so here we have done the uh, hard work. The remaining thing is just computing this path integration. Okay? And uh, in general, I, as I said, we cannot compute this exactly. However, we know how to compute it in the limit, in the g small. When g is small, the, 
the set point path is the most important path. So in this path integration, what is the most important path? Which path will give the largest contribution to this path integration? Hmm? L? Oh, yeah. So for which path is Lagrangian smallest? Hmm? Fixed angle. Which angle? Five, right? The five. So set point path. So we have a path integration from minus t to t for all sides, right? Where initial angle and final angle is fixed. Let's, yeah. Let's, this is the phi. And then set point path is the straight path for all sides. This is the set point path, right? Because for this path, at all time, there is no derivative. So the kinetic term, the velocity term, angular velocity term vanishes. And also, the relative angle between uh, neighboring rotor is zero. So cosine is maximized, right? So this is the path that give rise to the uh, largest weight. OK, uh, but then uh, how about uh, fluctuation? So uh, because, because this angle can change continuously, no matter how small g is, there's always some path where the uh, action is not too big, right? Although the prefactor 1 over g squared is 1 million, right? If you have a little bit of fluctuation, uh, you can have a reasonable size in your ground state wave function. So we have to worry about those fluctuations. Okay? So, and we have to, of course, the end point is fixed, but you can have some fluctuation around the set point path, right? And then whenever, whenever, the, whenever the angle deviates from phi, this factor oscillate, right? And when it oscillate, it creates the interference. Okay? So question is, does this does this angle swing all the way back and forth to minus pi and pi? Well, does it fluctuate more or less near this set point? That's the question. Okay? If it fluctuates, you know, because we are going to take the time t equal very a large limit. This cylinder is infinitely long, right? So even if you have a very small velocity, paying not much energy for the kinetic term, u term, you can, in general, you can have a path where this go all the way to the back and come back like this, right? You, you can have this kind of fluctuation, right? Then if this kind of paths are important, that will destroy the it will destroy the memory of the seed state. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, parameter, uh, uh, write this uh, path as the set point path. Set point path is phi. It's independent of side and independent of time, right? And then consider a little bit of fluctuation. Now, this fluctuation has to satisfy the boundary condition at the end point of the path integration, it has to vanish, right? And uh, in the small g limit, this has to be small, right? So therefore, we can expand that cosine function around the uh, uh, theta prime equals zero, right? That allows us to um, expand this and uh, keep only the leading order term. When this 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 is small, to the leading order is one, right? And then to the next order one minus one half, theta i plus mu minus theta i squared, right? So one is not important. It's just the overall normalization factor. So we are not going to worry about it. 
but this term is important. With this minus sign and minus sign, it gives the, oh, I don't have t here. I already scaled down, sorry. So with this uh, minus and minus sign, it gives plus of some uh, theta minus theta square, right? So whenever angle deviates a little bit with your neighbor, it uh, caused energy, it caused uh, action, right? So up to this point, this is exact, okay? And now in the small g limit, in the weak coupling limit, we can expand our action around the set point and keep only the quadratic term. Okay, this should be okay in the weak coupling limit. Okay, yeah. If you, you mean this kind of a path yes. with a non-zero kind of a winding? Yeah, that's, that's important, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, um, you can still have a very small gradient because this time is very large. So even if you go all the way around, d theta, d tau can be very small. And also, if you do it almost together with your neighbor, you can keep the relative angle with your neighbor very small. Okay? For example, everyone can, everyone collectively, imagine each of you are rotor, right? And everyone collectively rotate once as you do time evolution, right? Then your action remains pretty very small, right? and velocity is also small. So that kind of configuration give rise to some sizable weight in your uh, wave function. Okay, so now here is, from this to here, this is approximation in the small g, which is valid in the, in the uh, uh, limit that uh, u is small, okay? Then, um, now, because the leading order term here is a phi. From this phi, this theta zero have a phi, right? Okay, so I have some term that depends on phi. Okay. And then I have a path integration, now in terms of only theta prime. Phi is fixed, that point is fixed, and I'm only a sum over fluctuating mode. Okay? And then um, I have a this action, and uh, in this weak coupling approximation, I keep only the terms that are quadratic in, in theta prime. And uh, that term will give just some of mu, theta i plus mu minus theta i squared. times, most importantly, i times theta prime at zero. Because this guy is a phi plus theta prime, right? So theta prime, it depends on theta prime. Okay, now this is a Gaussian integration because um, it's a, uh, the e to the something quadratic in, in theta, right? So this one can compute. So I have to speed up. Uh, so, but um, in this representation, it's not so easy to compute this directly because uh, different sites are coupled with each other and angle at different time slices are coupled through this derivative term. So uh, in order to decouple different modes, it's useful to go into the free space. Okay? So I have this, uh, so I have this space and time. This is space, and this is imaginary time from minus, tau, minus t to t. And uh, in the time direction, 
I'm imposing this fixed boundary condition. The mode that the free mode that are allowed that has to vanish at these two ends, right? Then modes are kind of like this sinusoidal function. Right? And so there are infinitely many modes like this. Okay? So in the in the time direction, the loud modes are like this sine of it has to vanish at minus t, so sine of um, tau minus tau plus t, so that it vanishes at tau equal minus t with some frequency. But then this frequency cannot be arbitrary because at the other end it has to vanish, right? So that means uh, two t times omega has to be some integer multiple of pi, right? So loud this is the loud frequency, maybe labeled by integer m, not integer, positive number, right? Positive number, m pi over 2t. Okay, so this is the allowed mode in the frequency direction. In the spatial direction, uh, let's, for simplicity, um, impose the periodic boundary condition. In any dimension, you can you can do it, right? So that uh, you have some, uh, you can have constant profile. That mode is the mode where everyone rotate together, fluctuate together, right? Spatially, and you can have say a sine mode or a cosine mode, and more fast oscillation, right? Yeah. So those modes can be expressed as a uh, by some wave vector k. So we can write as a k dot r i, where r i is the lattice of sight in d dimension. Right? So I have a b1, b2, bd, where these are integer. So I'm, I'm, select, I'm keeping my lattice spacing to be 1, for simplicity, and these are, these are integer. That runs from 0 to l, right? But with periodic boundary condition, this phase factor has to come back when this r changes by l, right? So as it, from 1 to l, sorry. Okay? That means um, in any direction, k mu, mu's direction, k times l has to be some 2 pi times some integer. Okay? Let's call n mu. Okay? So allowed value of momentum here is 2 pi over L times some integer, and 1 and 2, etc. Okay? This is the allowed value of uh, frequency. And this is the allowed value of momentum. And each mode, so this is the most general mode that satisfies this boundary condition. And any pattern of fluctuation can be written as a linear superposition of these this modes by the completeness of the free mode, right? And they are all independent. So therefore, doing path integration of theta prime amounts to sum of all amplitude for each mode. So I have theta prime labeled by omega and k. And for normalization, because uh, there are this many frequency modes and that many uh, is, uh, the time interval is 2t and uh, space uh, number of side is v, so you can choose this normalization. Okay. Now, I was uh, planning to do this algebra, but I, I think I don't have time. But the derivation is in the lecture note in the, in the web page. So. But it's straightforward. You can insert this expression here to this quadratic action, right? And then do the time integration and uh, uh, side summation, OK? And then you will have some quadratic action for this amplitude. Now. Important thing is uh, because the action does not explicitly depends on 
side or time, modes with a different frequency and different wave vector do not mix. So the action is going to be diagonal in the free space. So, yeah. So I encourage you to check this explicitly. And this expression now become sum of all frequency and k, d theta omega k, and that action become e to d minus 1 over 4 t d, sum over omega, sum over k, omega square plus e of k, where e of k is sum over mu from 1 to d, uh, 2 minus 2 cosine k mu. Um, theta prime omega k square. Um, I have a one over two g square here, and then minus i sine pi n over two theta prime omega k. Okay. So so first this term where omega squared term arises from this uh, kinetic term. When you take the derivative with respect to tau, omega pops out, right? And there are two of them, so there's omega squared. And then when you do the frequency sum and the size summation, off diagonal term disappears, so therefore you have only a quadratic term between the same frequency and same momentum here. And uh, this E of k is just a free transformation of this guy. Most important part about this expression is that this expression vanishes when k is 0. So th that's the most important part. And then when k deviates from 0, this expression increases quadratically in k. So this is the most important part. So first, why does this term vanishes at k equals 0? Can someone uh, explain? Hmm? Right, so this k is the wave vector for spatial modulation. So k equals 0 mode is this constant mode, where k equal non-zero mode is a mode where you have some spatial modulation, right? So in the, in, the, in the soccer game, when all fans stand up and sit down together, that's the k equals zero mode, right? But if someone stands up first, then the other person, you make some wave, right? So that's the k equals non-zero mode. And k equals zero mode is the cheapest mode because when all people rotate by same angle together, you don't pay any energy here, right? That's why this vanishes at k equals 0. And when k is non-zero, then you create a little bit of, uh, little, little bit of uh, difference in angle be between your neighbor, right? So that, that costs some energy. And that energy increases as a k square. OK, that, that, that is this vector. And then here, where, of course, that comes from the linear term, the extra factor of sine of pi n over 2, where this n is the label for the frequency, this n, comes from the fact that um, for m equal 1, this is m equal 1 mode, right? This mode creates some fluctuation 
for the for the um, for this guy at time equals zero because that that observable is inserted here at time equals zero, right? So when these modes are excited, it creates a phase fluctuation. But when m is even, that for for example for m equal two, that is this mode. So that mode has a node here at t equals zero. So therefore, fluctuation of mode with even frequency does not contribute to the fluctuation in the expectation value. It's simply that, okay? So that, that, is, that is the origin of this term, okay? Okay, probably I will stop here and finish computing this expression tomorrow. And then uh, um, try to think about this expression and maybe you can even try to compute yourself and what, think of what you get from this expression. Well, there's a phi dependence here already. So question is whether this expression is zero or not. If it is zero, that means angles fluctuate wildly. So therefore, contribution from different phase cancels out. That means uh, your ground state doesn't remember the initial angle. That would be the conclusion if you get zero, right? Okay, I think that is, the, that is the more plausible thing, I guess. But on the other hand, if this is non-zero for some reason, that means the expectation value is non-zero and depends on the initial angle, right? In that case, you will have still infinitely many ground state. Because at each angle, depending on how you in initially prepare your seed state, you get a different ground state, okay? And this magic happens in the thermodynamic limit when the V goes to infinite. It doesn't happen at any finite system size. That's why we call this emergent phenomena, okay? So try to think what's special about the limit where V is infinite. So I will stop here. Very good. Uh, well, let's thank the uh, We really are a bit late. Let's try to aim at having the photo taken at one so that we have one hour. So let's have like seven minutes of questions at most, maybe eight.